So listen, I was, uh, the title of my message is called Assembly Required. Okay. And Assembly Required, okay. I was thinking to myself, what was it that took this jacked up kid? Uh, you know, my parents didn't think I was jacked up. That'd be a, you know, a poor thing on their parenting. <laughs> but I didn't realize you don't think you're a mess when you're in the middle of your mess. Right. You just think you're... Not where you could be. But now that I look back, knowing that I have this beautiful wife, three amazing kids, epic relationships, living on purpose, I then look back and go, what a train wreck. But in the middle of it, you just don't know what you don't know. And I'm thinking to myself, what were the things that got me to the place where I am today? So I figured I'd want to share that with you, especially during these times. What reminded me of, I've been really, you know, chowing on the bread, eating the good word in two books, Hebrews and Daniel. I've heard a couple people that I really respect preaching out of Danville, Danville. (laughs) Is this vodka? (laughs) Daniel. And, uh, and then Hebrews. And so I started reading them and I was starting to get my own revelation on them both. And then I was real, realizing, wow, the enemy would have loved to have had me in that place where I was. And thank goodness I ran into Pastor Jurgen when I did. Because it was a moment, some people call it serendipity. I just call it Jesus loves me and was trying to help me and got me interceded with the man that really showed me what a pastor could be. And it restored, redeemed, and healed some areas that I didn't even know were broken in my life. I was reading this thing. It said, if you can master and destroy the 13 enemies you can't see, egotism, arrogance, conceit, selfishness, greed, lust, intolerance, anger, lying, cheating, gossiping, and slandering. Dear Lord, we need Jesus. I mean, just reading those. I think I was every one. You will be ready to fight the enemy you can see. Those are the ones that we can be in denial about, and yet people are sitting there questioning, do we really need Jesus? Even right now. It's amazing. So this is what I've learned really is how important essential church is. And I'm not just talking during this time. It was important before because it helped me get to where I am today. But now more than ever, if there's a voice we need to listen to, it's the churches that are speaking bold truth and not backing down, not apologizing, and not tiptoeing around touchy subjects. It's almost like since we've already ripped the Band-Aid, let's just start talking about everything that we need to talk about. And it's so freeing. Like, it was amazing. I grew up and, and I never heard the word abortion in my church the entire time growing up. Yet you get privately, you'd hear the frustrations with it. But yet they'd never talk about it publicly from the platform and then try to help lead people into making better decisions. Well, I love Prager. You, Dennis Prager, you know, the guy's Jewish, and he said he never felt so at home than when he came here. And he came here as the guest of another program, Public Square, and we just let him use our building. This time he's coming back on our dime for a specific purpose that we're going to unleash him on. He says he just hasn't been around hungry Christians like he was. He said, that was the hungriest I've seen. How can you tell? They were pulling stuff out of me I've never said. I was like, wow. But here's a man well studying. He says, you know, critical race theory and all these things that our kids are being taught right now are going to be the termites to the house. And he says, the only last Bastion of hope is the Judeo-Christian church, and they better rise up and wake up. And I'm going to tell you, that's why we're putting such a hard push. We don't want you to miss it. If you're a parent, don't miss it. It will change the way you speak. If you have kids, bring them. It will change the way they think, change the way they study. We are now in our internship program, putting the entire Prager University library for all our interns 
to grab a part of it, that they must understand, they must learn, they must become critical thinkers. We're a product of our preachers, teachers, everything. And uh, we, we can't just say, oh, because they said so. We'll stand before the king of kings one day. And he's like, hey, why'd you do this? Oh, because they told me. Right. It's not going to work out. But listen, Book of Hebrews w- was written by a Hebrew to other Hebrews, telling the Hebrews to stop acting like Hebrews. <laughs> so it's really many of the early Jewish believers were slipping back into the rites and rituals of Judaism in order to escape persecution. It's amazing how many Christians don't want to be persecuted right now. So you're watching them either back up or run forward. There's no, there's no mediocre anymore. There's no middle ground. There's no, they're either silent or they are bold. I think you know where we stand. I just saw Pastor Leanne post a picture. Pastor Jurgen was reading his Bible and getting a coffee really early this morning and I was reading his shirt going, oh my, he just does not care. He does not care. He is bold. But Hebrews is really a letter that's an exhortation to those persecuted believers to continue in the grace of Jesus Christ. That's why it was written. And so no matter where you're at today, I think it's really important that you read the book of Hebrews. Get a study guide, grab some other friends, be reading that book to understand that it's no different back then, it is right now. And it's giving you the faith injection you need, the biblical background, the foundation which you need. If we don't have a foundation, then what do we have? Are you building your house on the rock or on the sand? So it's super important. You know, uh, let me read you this verse. Why church? Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day is in his return drawing near. What I think is so important is that we build the foundation on why we gather. Why do we need to come to church together? There's a couple things that I want to tell you that we can take for granted. You know, when we were shut down for three months, it was a little funky. And at first, we're kind of like, cool. Man, we all get a break. But then I'll tell you, three months, four months, five months, by June, we're over it. And now we're trying to figure out, all right, how do we get this thing back up and going? And July, we started to feel the pressure because we saw the suicide rates. We saw the mental health issues. We saw destruction even in our own church. And then finally we realized this no longer can happen. And then in that awakening, if you will, and we opened August 23rd, we said, that's it. We're never going back. And then we didn't know what we didn't know until we came together and we felt the breath of life breathe on us. We felt the power of the Holy Spirit breathe on our worship service. We saw radical things start to happen. We saw people getting healed, set free, restored at such an alarming rate we realized that we were starting to get numb and we were starting to settle and be okay with what we are told. It's amazing. It was like the boiling frog syndrome. You know, I put the frog in and if it was hot water, it'd jump right out. But you just slowly leave that frog in the water and you turn that heat up, turn that heat up, turn the heat up. Next thing you know, you got frog legs. But that's what's happened to the church. That's what's happened to the greatest country in the world is that we've slowly just settled, settled, settled until we're now getting pushed. Some people are in a corner and they're saying, not today, devil. And some people are still like, well, it's just what we got to do. And so that's why I want to talk about it. But there's four experiences God makes available when we gather in person. And I want to give them to you real quick. Number one is access. We experience his presence in a greater capacity than possible in our own personal devotion. Now, personal devotion is important, but it can't be the only thing. We need to have access. Number two is authority. We exercise binding and loosing power in our prayers at a higher level. Number three is accountability. We count and can be counted on. It's just not the platform to the pew, but between the pew and you. This right here is a family. This helps you not isolate. It's amazing what people can do when we isolate. Obviously, I mean, do I go there? (laughs) Some of the DMs I get. Some of the DMs I get. Dr. Matt, if you don't wake up to this, I go to your church, I'm going to leave your church. 
I'm like, okay, I think we're pretty good. Where did you hear that stat? Google, I know it for sure. Okay, well, I know that person personally, and they're okay. No, you shouldn't have a leader up there like that. Um, I know the fruit of that leader, and I think they're okay. You must do something. I think you've been alone too long. <laughs> you haven't been to church in a while. Accountability is important. Isolation, you start thinking weird thoughts. Start getting on the wrong chat groups. This right here is accountability. This right here will keep you set on true north, biblically based in a community. That's why connect groups are important. That's why being in DNA courses, what, is, what does this church believe? Why are we raising you up? I love this. He's on the guitar and on the high team. Let's get in. I was thinking to myself, what helped me? And this was one of the keys was accountability. Last one, number four, is anointing. There's an oil that flows when the church gathers in unity. You know, I always look for uh, red flags in people's language. You know, they start saying, uh, you know, it's just me and Jesus. I'm I'm doing the Jesus thing. Okay, well, you can do it together. It's always the fruit of what starts getting weird when I start. It's just a red flag. I just, I hear someone say it. I just make a mental red flag note. Let me write that down. Yeah. I'm going to look in three months where they're at. It's never good. Yeah. Right. When they say I'm doing the Jesus thing, no, no, I don't need church. Right. I do it online once in a while. Listen, I, fight, I FaceTime my wife once in a while. <laughs> How many know it's the real thing that's much better? I mean, FaceTime will get me through a weekend. Right. Get me like, oh my gosh. But that's three months of FaceTiming. Yeah. With my wife, it would never be healthy. I don't care what anyone says. Same thing with church. If you're awake, I'm, thank God we have online. But it's not the real thing. It's not the real thing. So important. It's so important. You know, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty says this. When you meet together, you're not really interested in the Lord's Supper. For some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. As a result, some go hungry while others get drunk. It's amazing. When you do a deep dive on that verse, it's just talking about, hey, don't do life alone. Don't just do it and just come in, get church, eat real quick, and leave. We want to be around and get saturated in what God's doing. You know, God revealed two things to me that I had a problem with. See, my parents always told me I had an authority problem. Like, you have an authority problem. You know, I manifested that. I named my kid Maverick. And I go, maybe I do. (laughs) No, it wasn't that. It's just that I had two issues that were keeping me from breakthrough. So I grew up pretty much in bondage that I have an authority problem. I have an attitude problem. I have this authority problem. So I had this belief that I had an inner vow and I had an authority problem. So I was just like this little rebel kid. So then every time I'd go somewhere, I'm like, well, I'm a rebel. I might as well fulfill it. And I would. But then I met Pastor Jurgen, and then, what's that? Tell us the story. You know, they couldn't handle any of my stories. <laughs> so then, thanks, babe, thanks, thanks for that. Uh, so what happened was I met Pastor Jurgen, and as I was in church, one of my most common things were I'd go on Sunday, I'd go on Sunday night when we had Sunday night services, I then would go to the Wednesday night worship night or prayer meeting, I just tried to get around, and I said to Pastor Jurgen, no joke, I said, I need church every day. Because what I was doing is I was so far off the true north, on Sunday I would go and I'd feel free, real freedom. I would then go Monday, and I'd be good Monday. Tuesday, not so good. By Wednesday, I need an altar call. I'd get my altar call, I'd get prayer, Thursday I'm good. Friday, Friday night, temptation, not so good. Saturday, I need an altar call, but there was nowhere to go. So I had to suffer till Sunday. I'd probably be at the altar before there was an altar call. Pastor Jurgen was probably going, what am I going to do with this kid? But I realized that I didn't have an authority issue. I had a submission issue. I didn't know how to submit, which means sub means come under a mission. So I was just on my own mission. And guess what? The devil was in my ear. So I was on a mission to pretty much mess up my life. And while I was messing up my life, how many people are I going to take with me? So I was on submission to the enemy, but not submission to the house. And when I said that, it was funny. Uh, Some guy on Wednesday night, I said, man, I saw you get baptized. 
And he goes, Pastor, I need this every night. And I go, bro, you're going to be okay. I used to say the same thing. First six months, I'd cry every service. I'd say, why can't I just get this all the time? But then as God started to rebuild my life, rebuild my heart, rebuild my mindset, get me around different people. I was in a connect group. Then I met my bride. Then we're making our own connect group. And then all these things. We're just in this thing all the time. And God started to do radical things. And God matured me and strengthened me that I could go three days, that I could go five days. And man, when I made it my first week going, yes, Sunday to Sunday, man, I'm like, God's doing something up in here. I don't even think I cursed for a whole week. That's amazing. Okay. Some of you weren't impressed by that. Okay. Thank you. A lot of judgmental 9 a.m.ers. Okay. But I had to get under a mission. I just didn't know that's how God designed us. So it's amazing. American church is like check the box church. You don't find that in other cultures. You go to Africa, man, seven days a week, praise and worship. You go to third world countries where all they got is God, Romania. My uncle went to Romania. I didn't see him for a month. He was just supposed to go for three days on his way through. He stayed in a month in an underground church, said it was the most radical thing. He came back, changed his whole life. And he says, man, American church is so watered down. No wonder America, we're just think everything is cool because they've never seen anything radical. And then we get a pastor through and prays for somebody and you see the power of God hit them and then half the church leaves. If I don't see it on a Tuesday, I wonder if we're even praying to the right God. I mean, I need to see some radical deliverance, healing, ministry, power of God. Once you see it, you're not going back to this watered down stuff that I was raised in. Submission. Hebrews 13, 17 says, obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. I never did that before, by the way. Okay. Their work is to watch over your souls. They're accountable to God. That's a revelation. Give them reason to do this with joy and not sorrow. That's why I pray for Pastor Jurgen all the time. He had to put up with me for the first three years and I was off the rails. They would certainly not be, or not be for your benefit. Have confidence in your shepherds and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who give an account. I never heard that before. I just thought I had to go to church. That was what my mom wanted me to do. It's probably good for God to see me in church, check the box, and then afterwards, I'll clean up my own mess. But that's not how it is. Pastor Jurgen, I met him. He started showing me the gospel through a different lens. I realized, dude, I can do this thing Monday through Sunday, live an empowered life, but when am I willing to submit and have Pastor Jurgen speak into my life? It was this double-mindedness that I had to deal with. Right. It went on. The second thing I realized I had an issue with, it was serving. So funny, I highlighted the guy that's serving on two teams. I didn't even know how to serve on one. I thought they were lucky enough if I just attended church. But it's amazing. My heart was wrong. First Peter 4.10 says this. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. In the NLT, it says, therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially those in the family of faith. Yeah. I read this little poem. If I were the enemy, I would isolate God's people from one another. I would by any means possible create separation from one another. This would divide and break down the church. I would mask fear as being safe. I would use fear to induce hate, knowing the opposite of love is not hate, but fear. We know perfect love casts out all fear. Hate is the fruit of fear. Show me fear and I'll show you hate. If I were the enemy, I would encourage people to look at the government and politicians as their savior. It would work as a subtle idolatry. They would never know it or see it because it'd be subtle. The enemy is the kingdom of deception. The scriptures predict many will forsake the gatherings of themselves together. Too many have become comfortable with the uncomfortableness of not being with one another. Our dysfunctional disconnect is disturbing and dividing us. It's now time to unite together. It's amazing. I was looking up this thing about evil, and it says all throughout the Bible, this guy was writing out, he says there's always a trinity. There's a Christ in the Trinity, or these are Antichrist in the Trinity, and the Antichrist Trinity is government, economy, and religion. Fear, fear, fear. It's amazing how many people don't want to hear about it. 
but it's the truth. And when you know the truth, it's just set you free. Anti means replace or substitute. So if the government, if you don't make a stand against it, they just replace God because they're taking care of you. I love this motto, if it's their bill, it's their will. We gotta be careful how much freedom we'll let go of. In the few minutes that I have left, I just wanna give two things that can help us, a problem and a solution that we need to hear as the church. You know, as the United States of America, we are in a, a systemic war. And it's worth noting that the nation was founded upon about the idea that God created human beings to be free. And every church needs to preach this. If we don't have the revelation that the founders founded the principles based on total liberty and freedom, then we'll never have the revelation that we're called to be free. We must first come back all the way to the roots of how this nation was founded. It was based in freedom, and it must remain in freedom to thrive. Listen, the Declaration of Independence states that people are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know how you know if you're in the right church or not? When you walk in the high team, if they look happy, I'm going to attend. If they don't look happy, I'd get out of that church immediately. I'm just being serious. And we don't sit there and go, listen, if you're on the high team, we need you to be happy. This is Alicia Williams. She's over our pastoral care team. She's going to teach you how to be happy. That's not what we do. Because the joy of the Lord gets you lit on the inside. I know when people really have the revelation on Jesus and they get freedom and they're not bound up. Because I look at their face and I could see joy on it. I could watch men at men's prayer come in. I could tell if it's their first through fourth time. Because they don't look happy. They had a Sour Patch kid without the patch. Is that all right? My wife's entertained, I'm okay. It's going to be a good day. But what I'm saying is by the fourth, fifth, sixth time at men's prayer, I see joy. And then all of a sudden we'll get a DM from a wife. Oh my gosh, who is this guy? This is the guy I married all the time. At least once a, get, uh, uh, once a week I get a DM from a wife going, oh my gosh, he may have gone the first time, but I kick him out every time. I've never seen <laughs> such a train. I might keep kicking him. Yep. We need it. Come on. I don't care how good the coffee is. We still need a little nudge. Just go, just go. I don't want my wife looking all cute. Are you sure you just don't want to cuddle? Not on Tuesdays, babe. <laughs> Wednesday. Rain check, Wednesday. Rain check. Some of you don't get that joke. Okay. Yeah. Well, what is liberty exactly? Is freedom based upon the, the, the country where you live, or can it have a deeper meaning? You know, the Bible talks about free, freedom from cover to cover. Yeah. Cover to cover talks about freedom. That's why I love reading the book of Daniel. Here's Daniel. He interpreted a dream. He had a prayer life. He would pray three times a day. He had a solid prayer life. And then in Daniel, kings were coming to him. Even when they had bad news, you know what he did? He didn't sugarcoat it. He pretty much told King Nebuchadnezzar, you're screwed. And, And guess what? He didn't get killed. And then guess what? Everything he said came to pass. What I love about it, even though he he faced some trials. He never backed down. He never yeah. took a knee. Come on. Yeah. That's why every one of us should be reading the book of Daniel right now. Here he was anointed. He had a prayer life. He never backed down. He lined up with the one true God. He didn't let government tell him what to do. He didn't let government influence. He didn't let kings sit there and intimidate and mandate everything. He told the truth even when it didn't look good. Basically, on he even raised disciples. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I love them, that they were willing to stand because they saw the fruit of this man. They were willing to stand, be thrown in a fiery furnace. I mean, how many know if you had a testimony like that, there should be revival? (laughs) Yeah, I just got all the smoker. Everything's fine. (laughs) Oh, yeah, they threw me full in. I'm a disciple of uh, Daniel. Yeah, yeah, I just do what he does because I see the fruit in his life. So I get around people that I believe in. I'm just going to do what they do because I see the fruit in their life. And even when a king made another mandate, there was a king that made a mandate. 
because of popular opinion. He was still unwilling to yield. So he prayed three times a day and he was told not to. So then that king at the time, being a man of his word, said, man, you broke the law. So I just got to do this, even though he regrettably didn't want to do it. So he did, and he threw him in with the lions. And then Daniel became a lion tamer, and he didn't back down again. And then when the king saw this, he said, get him up out of there. So then they got him up out of there, brought him up. He stood before the king, says, thank goodness you're okay. Now, where are your accusers? And he threw them and all their families, and they're immediately devoured. You're going to see that happen again. If it happened in the Old Testament, it could happen in the New Testament. Don't think... God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What do you believe? He's just looking, where are my prophets that aren't apologizing? He's looking for somebody. But listen, people have been searching for freedom for thousands of years. The first three chapters, Adam and Eve gave up their freedom. And we've been entrenched with sin ever since. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He comes to get us deceived. How do you know when you're being deceived? You don't. That's the problem. But when you're around the right people, and if truth starts nudging you a little bit, then you got to wake up. I just had a full-blown two-day conversation with somebody that's fully deceived. How do you know when you're being deceived? What are your guardrails? Who do you have in your life? Honestly, I remember one of my best friends, one of my best friends, started dating a crazy person. And I'd be like, hey, bro, I'm going to tell you something. I think she's crazy. No, no, man, I love her. I think she's the one. Okay, okay. Um, Let's do another way. Let's get four or five of our friends together. I just want you privately, not in front of her, let's just ask our four or five friends what they think. No, I don't need to do that, man. Okay, okay. Um, This isn't going to go well for you. You asked, uh, remember, you know, in our... Our bro day, you said, hey, man, if I ever date somebody that you don't think is right, I'm giving you full permission to speak in my life. Great. Here's today. I'm here today. Remember that talk? It's right now. Yeah, but it's different. Okay. All right. Well, here's the things I've noticed. Here's the notes I've taken. Isolating you. You're not allowed to hang out with your friends. I mean, this is typical. Chose that way. It didn't go well for him. He was deceived. Love can do that to you. So can Satan. How do you know when you're being deceived? It was amazing when this person was trying to tell me about this one person that we had at our church. And I said, huh, that's so weird. So they deceived me, my entire executive team, Pastor Juergen, a couple other good pastors. Man, we, we must all not hear from the Lord. But you want to come hear from us every Sunday and teach? Like, this doesn't add up. But yet now, because I'm not listening to you because you Googled something that had a picture to it that you're applying meeting, aren't you the one maybe being deceived? Didn't want to hear that. So then I'm not a shepherd that you're going to listen to. Because as a shepherd, we're called to protect and correct. But what are your guardrails? We all need them. Who are your friends? What is your connect group? Who do you have in your life that can speak truth to you that you'll receive it when the enemy comes in like a flood to cause deception in your marriage with your kids? Are we coachable? It's amazing all throughout history what happens when we don't listen. I was reading this uh, part right here. It says, too many people are living in spiritual slavery without realizing it. They chase false gods, whether it's money, worldly fame, personal comfort, and romantic love, only to realize they still have an emptiness that can't be filled by any of those things. Goes on to say, when I was reading the book of Danville, Dan, Danville, again, (laughs) Daniel. I don't know why I need Danville. Danville must have some stronghold. That's where I was born. It's in the Bay Area. Ah, Less vodka. That's a joke, people. That's a joke. But everybody worships something. What are your guardrails? I remember when I bought my first Porsche. I knew three years into it, it'd become an idol. And I had a tough decision to make. It's fear of the Lord 
fear of man, love my Porsche, do the right thing. I remember in worship when God says that car got you, I had to have a real conversation with myself. And I said, God, I, I would rather chase you all the days of my life than drive that dumb car. Yeah, yeah. And literally drove it straight in and traded it in that day because I didn't want to think about it anymore. See, I knew how far God had taken me out of where I had come from, and there's no way in God's green earth I'm ever going back. So I had to have guardrails put up in my life. I mean, if I'm in worship and God's trying to talk to me, I need to listen. If my wife is trying to say something, even if I don't like to hear it, I need to listen. I have certain friends in my life that even if I don't like what they're saying, I need to listen because I've given them permission. We all, none of us are above that. But the devil works over time to divide a church, to divide a family, to divide a marriage, to divide a friendship. If you don't have guardrails, there will be division. I said it before, we're fighting the flesh, we're fighting the world, we're fighting the devil. And yet we think once or twice a month that church is gonna get us through. And we need to be saturated. Just this morning in worship, I could feel God starting to heal up. You just don't know when you're getting a little numb. I already said, it was like I came in and I felt the gas pump filling my soul this morning. And I'm around all the time. I'm thinking to myself, I need to have more meaningful conversations about things that matter. Not with Instagram, not a keyboard warrior with my real friends, speaking about real things, doing life together with real people. That's why we do the internship, over 100 interns that become family. They become part of this family to do radical things. See, God's answer to loss of freedom has always been Jesus. I love when Jesus started his ministry. He started well before he came out doing the miracles. He said this, I'm gonna read this verse to you. Jesus stood up. And he was saying the future had arrived, meaning liberty would come through him. He grabbed a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. It was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. And it's Luke 4, 17 through 21 that says at this point, at this time, this is what he read. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is Jesus reading this scripture in front of all the people that are going, okay, what's about to go down? Because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering sight to the blind, to set liberty to those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of the entire synagogue were fixed on him. And he began saying to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. What would you do if you were Jewish sitting there? Listen to this kid, read that verse, saying, I'm the one. There's only three things. I love uh, Tony Campolo, my dad's favorite preacher. He said Jesus was either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. You don't get up and read that and say, here I am. He's either a liar, a lunatic, or he is who he said he was. And it's amazing because so many people, even my Jewish friends would go, oh man, he was a great prophet. Well, no, he wasn't. He was either who he said he was or he was crazy. You, there is no middle ground. Jesus came to bring liberty to every single one of us. The entire Bible was written and it was fulfilled in Hebrews. Hebrews goes on to talk about all the scriptures that were being fulfilled, all the prophecies that were being fulfilled, all the things that were said of the Messiah to come. Jesus came to bring liberty. It's amazing how many Christians that believe in Jesus aren't free. They're so bound up in religion, so bound up in money, so bound up in government. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Anything that's producing fear is the opposite of what this Bible is trying to tell us. Everything points to Jesus. If we don't have Jesus in our heart, we can never be free. And we're talking eternity is on the line. As we have that revelation today, just some final thoughts. 
God's word points to freedom in Christ. He doesn't leave us wondering how we're going to grab it. He's pointing the whole thing. It's a free gift. Free gift, free dumb. What I love about the word of God is he breaks it down as easy as possible for us to understand. If we don't choose Jesus, we will be bound. If you don't like the fruit in your life, then my question is, where are we not yielding to Jesus? See, I could say that I remember I gave my life to Christ as a kid, but I didn't like my fruit because guess what? I wasn't living free. I was in the driver's seat still, and I had Jesus over here. But he said, if you want true freedom, get out of my way. Just move over. I got you, son. The hardest thing I had to do is let go of control. Come under someone else's mission and serve the kingdom. And then Matthew 6, comes in the face. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. It's a verse that sat there my whole life right in front of me. And it wasn't just until maybe four or five years ago that I fully had the revelation on it. So you got to understand that I just saw the fruit of Pastor Jurgen's life and I knew if I did what he said I should do as a good shepherd, I saw the fruit of my life getting better and getting better and getting better. So I did what he said because I liked my results. How many know that's not still freedom? That was performance. So I was still doing the things he said to do because I trusted him. I liked the fruit of him. So I did what he said because I liked the experience and I liked the feeling. But it wasn't until the penny dropped 18 inches. I was 18 inches from freedom. When I finally understood that I don't have to perform, that I don't have to do these things, the penny dropped 18 inches into my heart, and it was seek first the kingdom. That's when I decided, hey, I'm coming home from seminars Saturday night. I'm coming home from the river Saturday night. Everybody still today is like, you're, you're, you're leaving right now? Even yesterday, you're packing up right now, going to church tomorrow. Well, wait, what? I mean, you could just watch online. Well, technically I'm preaching, so I should go. But (laughs) even if I wasn't, I'd still be coming back. You know what? Because I need to be around this. I need to be around this to be saturated in it. So everything that oozes out of me is seek first the kingdom. See, if I stayed out there, it'd be seek first what I wanted. I was relaxed. I was chilled playing with my kids. Seek first Matt's will. Let me see how that turns out. See, it wasn't until I started saying, hey man, I can keynote for you, but it's going to be after on Friday. Well, keynote Saturday. Well, if you want me as keynote, make it Friday. That doesn't make sense. Okay. I'm not missing church on Sunday. Bro, you're going to miss out on every speaking gig. And for a year I did until everybody started knowing I was serious. I was being tested. And in that test, I got all the invites back. And in that test, I've watched the fruit of God's blessing, favor, and anointing come on my life. It's when I put the right things in the right order, in the right way, that I watched Jesus start leading the car, driving it, and it took all the stuff away from me, and I watched the fruit of that. If he did it for me, he'll do it for you. If you could all bow your heads and close your eyes. The revelation is you can be a Christian and still be bound up. You can still be stuck wondering, God, why am I stuck? And I'm telling you, get under a mission. Whatever you're hurt, maybe churches have hurt you. Maybe they've been let, you know, they've led you down. Listen, pastors, we're all humans. You know, we don't have it perfect. But I promise you this. You might see us up on the altar, getting our life right. Because we want to be who we are called to be. If you're one of those Christians that aren't really loving the fruit of where you're at, just feeling a little bit stuck, and you know it's just an alignment thing, it's just a seek first thing, it's just you know there's something more on the inside of you, I just want you to lift both hands up in the air real quick, and I'm going to pray for you. It's so important. I was this guy. And part of it is just submitting to the fact, man, I'm just asking you to put your hands toward heaven as a signal. That's it. I'm not trying to control anything. I just want you to signal heaven, saying, God, that's me. I need to see radical things. There's some areas of my life I just want to submit to you. Heavenly Father, God, you see these hands. 
God, right now, Lord, Holy Spirit, I just thank you for moving. Lord, I thank you that there's a church on fire. A church alive is worth the drive, and we're right here. God, I thank you, Lord, that you're igniting these men and women right now. Lord, that we're submitting some things that we need to lay down. We're having revelations on some areas that we quite haven't given up, but we want to be in total freedom. We want to be in your kingdom. God, we want you to take over. We want you to guide the ship. We want to hear your voice on every business decision, life decision, friend decision. God, we just want to give it to you so you can show us the way. We want our life to line up with biblical breakthrough of true freedom, of true liberty. God, I thank you right now. Lord, give discernment and wisdom to those hands that are lifted. God, we thank you for your favor right now. I thank you for your blessing right now. In Jesus' name, amen. And for the other group of people I want to pray for, if you've never given your life to Christ, with every head bowed and eyes closed, not looking around, I just want to honor this time. If you said, man, I've never asked Jesus to be my Lord and Savior, I want to give you that opportunity. I just want you to stick your hand up real quick. If I see your hand, I'm going to pray for you. I just want to pray there's no greater freedom. We're talking an eternity on the line right here, saying, I want to give my life to Christ. If you've never done that before, I'm going to give you this chance right now. Anybody right now? Come on. I see that hand. Thank you, young lady. Come on. Thank you. Come on, I see that hand right there on the second row. Once you've raised your hand, you can put it down. Thank you for being bold. This is the greatest decision you could ever make. Let's all stand to our feet right now. Come on, let's all say this together. I got the one golf clap. Thank you, Kevin. We should all be clapping. Hey, listen, it says when one person raises their hand, there's a party in heaven. Even if you don't have espresso, there's still a party in heaven. But let's all say this out loud for those two young ladies that lifted their hands. I just want you to say this prayer, and then one of my team members are going to find you. And if they don't find you to pray with you, I want you to ask for a Bible. We have a Bible right down here and a Following Jesus book we want to we want to give you and equip you with. Really, it's not about raising your hands. It's a decision in your heart. God gave you free will. I can't make you lift your hand. I can't make you come get a Bible. It's a free gift. We're a free church. Do whatever you want. But follow Jesus and let us help you. Discipleship is so important. That's why we have DNA classes and deliverance classes and freedom classes and all these classes just to equip the saints. But let's say this prayer. Heavenly Father, come on all of us. Heavenly Father, I thank you that your son died on the cross for my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me. I give you my heart. Make it new today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening. To find out more about our locations, team, and what we do here at Awakened Church, go to awakenedchurch.com.